Uh, good morning, uh, colleagues. Um, so today we have a very interesting talk uh, on machine learning for causal inference and explain, explainable AI from um, the Dr. Uh, Kevin uh, Bevan uh, Smith, my apologies for it. And uh, Dr. Smith is a senior lecturer in the School of Mechanical Industrial and Aeronautical Engineering at WITS. He has a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from Pretoria University and a master's and a PhD from the School of Mechanical and Industrial and the Aeronautical Engineering at WITS University. His primary research interests are in the applications of the machine learning to causal inference, explainable AI, and the counterfactual explanations. Bevan, over to you. Oh, well, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so my talk is uh, entitled Machine Learning for Causal Inference and Explainable AI. And actually one of the main goals that I didn't actually include in that title, but it's within the, the explainable AI section is this matter of counterfactual explanations or causal models. Okay, but we'll get into that in a minute. So a little bit of the overview. Just going to bring you through some basics of causal inference, uh, just a little bit of the, the ideas, the concepts, the theory, and then how machine learning, as far as I know, I don't know everything, but as far as I know, how it's been applied to uh, causal inference. Then I'd like to explain uh, mach explainable machine learning, or this is also called interpretable machine learning, and then uh, getting to the main goal, which I think is the, is the goal of of this all is to talk about counterfactual explanations or causal models, and then give you a little bit of a big idea. Okay, causal inference basics. Okay, so uh, we actually are causal people. I like to just use that word, we're, we're causal beings. We're always trying to find what's the cause of something. Actually, if you just, just check yourself today, if you, uh, if you get a headache, at some point, you can say, I wonder what caused that headache. Or uh, if your child has a tummy ache, then, you know, like my wife will say, it was probably, probably that thing that we gave, we gave him to eat, right? We're always trying to, um, we're always trying to find the cause of things. So for example, did the headache tablet cause the headache to go away? These are some examples. Did that company policy that we implemented, did it cause the increase in sales? Not only was it correlated, but did it cause, right? Um, I see the pictures over that last one. I don't know if they can, they can see that. Um, or what got me into this was because I've been working with, um, with the academic development unit for more than a decade. My question was, do extra tutorials, extra videos, supplementary things that you can add to a course, do they cause an improvement in marks? All right, so these are all, Either we're asking causal questions in our daily life, or we're asking causal, we need to ask causal questions in our company, here at the university, even what is the meaning of it all, right? Okay, so just want to give you a bit of a, just a kind of my background here. Um, I was asking these questions, did the extra tutorials cause the higher grades? Okay, so if you have a group of students, that self-select to attend your tutorials, right? And say now your, your marks are higher for that specific group. Was it the tutorial or was it that, that group of students? Okay? What if your students were more diligent? What if they're harder working students that chose to attend your, uh, your tutorial? Or what if it was a, um, a, 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 a person that was perhaps healthier? or a person that was more sick, that chose to receive the treatment, okay? The other question is, what if the students that attended got worse marks? So on the one hand, what if the students that attended your tutorial um, got better marks? Was it the tutorial or was it because of some of their, their characteristic, their, their diligence, their hard working? But what happens if your marks were worse? So you see all of these questions, we need, to, we need to try to find out, okay? So this is, um, this is what we call a directed, a cyclic graph, a gag. And the Y over there, if you can see the Y, 
It is the actual outcome that we're trying to measure. For example, an uh, increase in sales, some, some kind of thing that you're measuring and improving of the marks. And the T is the treatment, okay? The extra, the extra tutorials, the extra videos, the poll, that different policy, that's the treatment. Now, an X is just the, uh, are the characteristics of the, the participants, the students. Uh, these are the characteristics, okay? And the, the, the problem here is that we have something called confounding. So confounding is when the students themselves, let's stay with students to, to kind of solidify this idea. The students are not only a cause of the, the outcome, but they, they also a cause of who takes the treatment. So as I was saying before, if your students are more diligent and they're the harder working students and by nature they're getting better marks, and so they naturally will take your, your extra tutorials. Then was that those extra tutorials, the treatment, was that the true cause of the better marks or is it due to the, the students? So as you can see, this is, this is a nice picture, a dag of confounding. It's when we have a, a feature that is a cause of both a parent rather even, of both the treatment and the outcome. So what do we want to do is we want to make the treatment independent of the those input features x. So this is a DAG that shows no confounding. So, so this is ultimately what we want to do is so that we have only the effect of that treatment on, uh, on the output. So this is this is our goal. Okay, so here we have essentially the, the formula or the equation for average causal treatment effect, ATE. And what you'll notice is it is the difference when you want to measure treatment effects, we need to find out what's the difference between a group that received the treatment and a group that didn't receive the treatment. But I don't know if you've ever seen that, um, that terminology that we have the expected value of the Y given do T equal one, do, okay? That's a, maybe you've never seen that before. Maybe many of you have. So, so we'll get to this matter of do later minus the expected value of Y given do T equals zero. So the T equals one and the T equals zero are essentially the two groups that received the treatment and didn't receive the treatment. But it's important that we, we have that do uh, operator, which is comes from Judea Pearl causality. Um, and it's not just uh, your conditional um, expectation, but it's actually an interventional. It's a, it's, whoops, it's a do t equals one, do t equals zero, okay? So what are these two? These two quantities are called potential outcomes. The one on the left is the, the potential outcome for a group receiving the treatment, and the other one is for the group not receiving the treatment. And here I'd like to introduce this, this incredibly important word, the counterfactual. What we have here is we have a, a factual and a counterfactual. We have, um, we have a group that at the same time received the treatment and at the same time did not receive the treatment. But this is, this is the goal of uh, causal inference is you need this counterfactual. So this is a, a hypothetical what if scenario. So for example, point one, what if he took the tablet and did not take the tablet at the same time? So we need, we need everything to be the same between these two groups, except the treatment itself. Or point two, what if she attended the tutorial and did not attend the tutorial at the same time? You can, you can hear that this sounds kind of crazy, um, but these are called potential outcomes. And for us to measure treatment effects, we need the counterfactual and we need these potential outcomes. But here is the fundamental problem of causal inference. You cannot observe more than one potential outcome at a time. You cannot observe the factual and counterfactual at the same time. Okay, so what do we do? We all know this. We run a randomized control trial. 
Uh, this is called the gold standard of causal inference, the gold standard. Why? Because it does a pretty good job at approximating the counterfactual. There we have that, uh, that, that ATE formula at the bottom there. Um, because we know we take a group, a random randomized group. We take, well, we have two randomized groups and we, own, we give one of the groups the treatment. And the reason why it's the gold standard and why it approximates a counterfactual is because statistically, those two groups are identical. Those two groups are identical statistically. So the only difference between the two groups is the, the actual treatment. Okay, now what is the, the, what is the problem? Randomized control trials are not always possible. Sometimes it's unethical. For example, if you're going to, uh, if you want to know where the smoking causes cancer, it is, I would suggest it's unethical to give 100 people, tell them you need to smoke for, uh, for 20 years. And uh, you guys, you guys are fine. You, don't, you shouldn't smoke for 20 years. And then after 20 years, we'll come back to you and see who got cancer. Right? So, so it is, it is unethical. It is also very costly. It's costly to, to, uh, to take a bunch of people and, and run this kind of randomized trial and follow-ups and all this kind of stuff. So what do we, what is the alternative? The alternative is observational studies. This is data that we haven't do, we haven't do anything yet. I'm sorry for the poor English. We didn't do anything. We just observed. It's just data that we've collected over time. We've observed it, okay? This is data that's not randomly assigned treatment, but the important thing is it is self-selecting. The participants self-select. They're not randomly assigned, but they, they, they select it themselves. What is the problem with this now? Well, we can come back to this very simple DAG. The problem is when people self-select, we generally have confounding. So the treatment that you're gonna measure from T onto, onto Y is going to be biased because you're going to have that influence of, that, um, of X on T, okay? So again, this is what we want, is we want to take our observational data that has this bias in it, that has confounding, and we want to break that relationship between X and T. We want to make them, um, I forget the exact word now, but it's independent, but there's a specific ignorable, okay? We need to break that relationship so that Y, um, so, so that T is not a function of X. Okay, so observational study, again, this is observed, not intervened, we're not intervening. So we have a naive uh, uh, treatment effect, which is simply the expected value of Y given T equals one now, minus the expected value of Y given T equals zero. So this is just simply your conditional um, expectations. You haven't, we haven't uh, intervened on the system. We haven't touched the system. We're just looking at the system and extracting that data. But again, as I mentioned, it is biased due to confounding from self-selection. So when you, when you measure that, that value there, uh, it may contain the true treatment effect, but actually there's, there will most likely be bias as well. Okay, so the next point is just, um, so is this observed data identifiable? What that means is, can we find, we've got this ob observed data, can we, find causal relationships from the observed data. Meaning, can the P, the probability of Y given duty, can we get that from the probability of Y given T? So what do we need to do? Convert the observational statistical data into causal data via things that we already know. Adjustment, controlling, conditioning, and, and Judeo Pearl called it the backdoor part, right? Um, um, so essentially, what we're doing is we are now controlling for the confounders in observational data. So if you go back to that, that DAG that I showed you, um, the reason why the reason why there's uh, there's confounding is because um, 
x is varying with t, and t is a, is a function of x. But if we can fix x to a specific value, then it no longer has a function. It no longer is a parent of t. Okay, and this is essentially what we're doing when we are adjusting, when we are uh, controlling. Okay, so uh, what are the traditional methods? Matching there, I've got it in yellow. Matching is kind of the essential idea of getting a factual and a counterfactual. The PSM is propensity score matching. That is kind of a, a little bit more of a, a further step of matching, where you use probabilities, logistic regression to estimate the probability of receiving the treatment. IPTW is inverse probability treatment weighting. It's a very similar idea. And of course, we have regression. Okay. So, so now, this is a very cool talk. I'm going to have to, I'm going to, have to really speed up. Uh, all, all that we're showing there is we have the entire population, and we have a group that takes the treatment t equals 1 and t equals 0. If you just condition on those groups, you can see those two groups are not the same. But what we actually want is we want to intervene. We want to do t equals 1 and do t equals 0. So what is matching? So if we've got the, the ducks on the left, Okay, and we've got the bunch of ducks on the right. Matching is I want to find uh, matches close enough to the individual ducks or the individual people or whatever, so that we are approximating a counterfactual. So we've got a yellow duck and a yellow duck. Okay, they're pretty good. Then we've got, unfortunately, I can't show on the on the actual um, slides. We've got a little blue duck. And we've got a gray duck that closely matches. So you can see it's, it's, it's got the same uh, shape and size, but not the same color. So you can see we're, we're, we're coming into a little bit of a problem here. Um, what about that pink duck on the left? The pink duck has no match on the right. So it has no counterfactuals. Okay. So this is, this is a, a good method. But um, what is the problem? It's difficult to match exactly. Um, even with propensity score matching, you have a probability of receiving the treatment. And even that, you need a kind of a caliper, a kind of a, a, a region in which you're going to match to. Remember, the point is we want a counterfactual. Okay? Uh, so it's difficult to match, especially when matching along multiple features. The more features you're measuring in your data set, the more difficult it becomes to find closer matches. Right, it's um, I forget the exact word that I'm that I'm thinking of now, um, and we throw away data. Okay, so what are the problems of the causal inference? Although it's great, wonderful, there's problems. One, uh, randomized control trials are difficult; they're costly and could be unethical, even though it's the gold standard. Okay, number two, observational studies, there's bias. The uh, matching PSM doesn't use all the data. It's difficult to match, although it is possible. And, and I would say it's still, these are still good methods, right? But what I want to take out of this talk is we, uh, we want a causal model, not just a measure of causality, but a model, which I'll get to in a, in a second. Okay, why is causal inference important? Uh, number one, we want to find features that are not only correlate, but causal to the outcome. Number two, this is the goal of this talk. It allows us to generate counterfactual worlds, causal models, which we'll get to in a second. Okay, let's quickly run through, <laughs> running out of time here. Machine learning for causal inference. Okay, so here's a, just an article. There's many of these uh, kinds of ideas. A reminder that machine learning is about correlations, not causation. Machine learning is excellent at predictions. Uh, it's excellent at taking data and uh, having nonlinear neural functions from neural networks to, to make good predictions. But you cannot assume causation out of, out of, a, um, out of a, a machine learning model. OK, so I'd like to just mention three specific types of uh, machine learning. There's more, OK? This is all that I've personally been exposed to, but there, there are definitely more uh, methods. And these are called meta-learners. Now, the idea behind a meta-learner is just remember that in an observational study, on the right-hand side, you've got a group that took the treatment and a group that didn't take the treatment. 
and they're obviously not necessarily statistically the same. So, uh, but I just want you to keep that picture in mind. So, an S learner, a T learner, and an X learner. What does what does this all mean? What does an S learner do? An S learner trains a single model on the entire data set. Treatment, no treatment. It just trains. It takes the entire data set, trains a model. That could be any model under the sun. Uh, and so, and so this is what it does. That U hat is the model. It's a function of X and T, where X is all the features and T is the treatment. So it is your expected value of your observed output given, given your X and T. Okay. Then what do you want to do with that single model? Now you've got tau. Tau means uh, average your treatment effect, your tau. Is now the difference. Remember, we, we're looking for the difference between a treated group and, a, and an untreated. We want the counterfactual, factual and counterfactual. And so this is a kind of an approximation. If you look, we've got mu, that's, the, that's that model. But what do we now feed into this model? We've now trained it. But now what do we, we, we chuck away um, everything and now we take the model and we only put in the treated data into that model and we get an outcome. And then we take that same model and only put the untreated, the, the control data into that model, and we get an outcome, and we find the difference between those two. Remember that we're trying to approximate that average treatment effect with the do t equals one and do t equals zero. Okay? So that's the S learner. It's a single learner. That's what it's called in the literature. It's got actually many names. Okay, what's the problem? The problem is that if you have a high dimensional data set, that T indicator, the T, could be ignored by the model, right? If it's very, very high, um, there's some literature showing that the, the that T could uh, just just because of the of the high dimensionality, that treatment could just go towards zero, and there could also be confounding features in in the in the data. So what's a T learn? The T learner now is. Um, we train two models, the one model on only the treated group and another model only on the control group. That's, that's what a T learner is. So I don't know if it, the T comes from two, single and two, uh, anyway. So U1 is uh, the expected value of, of just the treated group. And U0 is just trained on only the control data. And again, we use that same idea. Uh, the um, the average treatment effect is the difference between the, the treated um, model, the outcome of the treated model, and the outcome of the control model. What is the problem now with the T learner is it doesn't use all the data. Treated model is only trained on the treatment data, and the control model is only trained on the control data. And of course, this comes up all the time is this matter of confounding. Now, now we come to the, the learner of learners, the X learner. Okay. This, this is a little bit complicated. Um, so you can talk to me afterwards and uh, we can go through it a little bit more. But essentially, you've got, again, you're dealing with the control group and you're dealing with the treatment group. So that tau one, tau one, just look at tau one. It is a difference itself. And tau zero is also a difference. The tau one is the expected value of y one, meaning it is we only look at um, the output, the the observed actual data that we have, and then we subtract a counterfactual. What is that counterfactual? If you can see, we've got the uh, we've got that u zero there. U zero is the model trained on the control group. So what we're doing is we're taking treated data. And we're feeding it into the control model to get a, a counterfactual of the treated group. And we do the same with the, with the treatment uh, treated group, and we also get a difference there. And so effectively, this is the model that we use to measure treatment. It's pi times tau one plus one minus pi times tau zero, where tau one and tau zero are called the average treatment effect on the treated and the average treatment effect on the control. Okay. ATT and ATC. So the okay, I'm not going to go into all the detail here, 
but it, it, that's uh, that's the way to train the X learner and to measure the treatment effects. What is the pros of the X learner? It uses all the data. It uses all the data. Each model uses both treatment and control data to, to estimate the its treatment effects, and then they, it gets combined into a single model, a single calculation. Um, it attempts to more accurately predict counterfactuals, and it is actually based on theoretical uh, formula or, or, or theory, uh, which, which you can find in the Winship book. Okay? Now, we don't only want to uh, measure average treatment effects, the global treatment effects, but actually the literature is showing perhaps that's not so important. What we really want is we want to use these methods to measure heterogeneous, heterogeneous treatment effects, personalized treatment effects, individualized. How much will, um, how will this affect that student? How will this affect that patient? How will it affect this group of people in this age group, <clears throat> right? So it's called the ITE or the CAPE, which is your conditional average treatment effect or individual treatment effect. Okay, some questions, okay? Um, that I have not really found an answer for yet in the literature because it's pretty new, is how does it deal with observed and unobserved confounding? The, the, the literature that I've found is they've only looked at um, real-life data, which sounds good, okay, we must apply this to real-life data, but with real-life data, you do not know the ground truth treatment effects, okay? Uh, how does it deal with imbalance in the data? Right, those people that self-select the treatment, oftentimes it's a it's a it's ten percent or one percent. How does that imbalance affect these machine learning methods? Um, this is these are things that I'm trying to uh, research now. Um, how does it deal with non-linearity in the data? If we just assume line linearity, maybe that's good. But what about some? What about introducing non-linearity in the data? Do these models still work? Do Non-linear models that fit non-linearity, do they work better, like neural networks or perhaps random forests, things like that, okay? So what I'm trying to do now is to carry out Monte Carlo simulations to try to answer these questions. Okay, okay. So number three is, let's talk now about explainable machine learning. And at the end, I'm going to try my best to show you how this all ties in. What is explainable machine learning? Um, so machine learning has mainly been used for prediction. So we want to ask what, right? Perhaps that's the right question. What, what, what is this model predicting? What will the your grades be? What, 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 what? Okay, and it's done that very well. Um, and then we've just spoken about causal inference. Machine learning is, is now very much being used for causal inference. This is to maybe answer the question who, perhaps. Uh, you can argue with me that that's maybe not the right one. But we want to not only predict outcomes, we want to also know uh, which, what are the causal um, input features for those outcomes. Um, but we don't only want to know this, uh, like what, who, we also want to know why, okay? So we often have these very complicated black box models, like a, like a, a deep learning model that has many layers, it has many, Parameters, many coefficients to choose. It's 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 a very complex. It's an excellent predictor, but it's very difficult from that model to know what uh, the important input features are. So we we want to ask why did the model predict that the student will fail? We don't only want to know that the student will fail, but we want to know why it predicted that the student will fail, or why did the model predict that the client would not receive a loan? Yes, it predicted that, but we want to know why. Why did the model predict what it did? And um, this speaks to this matter of transparency and fairness. So I'd like to recommend this book, if you'd like to read up. It is, to me, the best book out there right now. Actually, it's almost the only book that I can find, um, giving you an entire view of interpretable machine learning or explainable machine learning by Christoph Molnar. So there's two main types um, that I've found or that I'd like to talk about. The one is interpretable model, this is intrinsic, and the other is a model agnostic method, post hoc. Interpretable models are ones that we're very used to. Um, in the model itself, you can actually get the, uh, you can explain the output. Regression, right, you just look at the coefficients, 
And in general, you can use the coefficients to tell you which of the features are more prominent in predicting the output. Uh, decision tree based methods, um, you can use uh, feature importances, those kinds of things. Um, and then you've got model agnostic methods, which are post hoc. What does this mean? It means you train a model, a complicated model on the data to get excellent predictions. Great, wonderful. But then post hoc means now you, you, um, now you take that model and you don't do any more training, but you perturb the input space in various ways. And we've got the global and local. Global is average and local is personalized. So again, I think we know this. Interpretable models are intrinsic regression decision trees. Okay, then we've got um, the model agnostic methods post hoc, which are now we've got global and local methods. So um, global methods include partial dependence plots. It's again, it's a kind of a tweaking of the input space to see how it varies with the output. Okay? Permutation feature importance. This is when you take a specific feature and you, you shuffle it randomly so that you are breaking any kind of correlational relationship that it has with the output. And what you're doing is you're seeing, does that feature, when I, when I destroy um, that potential relationship, when I make it random, does it affect the output? Okay, so that's one way of seeing if that feature is important. If it does affect the output, then we know that it's an important feature. And there's also something called global surrogate modeling. This is when you take that complicated uh, black box model and you train uh, some, some, well, you train it obviously, and then you feed in some inputs and you get some outputs, you throw away the model, you take only those inputs and outputs and you train a simple, a very simple, perhaps a linear model, a cheap model on that. That's called surrogate modeling. All right, so there's some um, ideas of, um, Partial dependence plots, partial dependence. There's, uh, there's uh, importances from, um, from decision trees. Now, what about local methods? Model agnostic local methods. These are, uh, again, um, you you've already trained the data. Sorry, you've trained the model on the data. And now you, again, perturb the input space. You get, you have inputs and outputs. And you then can train for Lyme, specifically Lyme is a local interpretable model agnostic explanation. You take, so what do you want to do there? You want to go to a specific individual, a specific case in your data, and you perturb the, the space around that case so that you get synthetic points close to that point, and you train the model only in that region so that you, so, and then because the idea is you want to explain, you want to explain that student, you want to explain that specific patient. Chat is a bit more complicated. Um, don't ask me to explain it, but it's basically we, we, we're training models with and without that feature in various different ways. And it's based on game theory. And apparently uh, the literature says that this is much more stable than line. Okay. All right. So here's an example of line. You've got a very non-linear space, um, precision boundary. And we want to explain that, that red plus. So what does Lyme do? It generates many local instances right around there. And then we train our model, a local cheap model, only on that the data in that area. OK, um, I see I've messed up the <laughs> this page. So explainable AI does not necessarily imply causality, though. So it's great to be able to um, see which of the features are um, predicted, and it can explain to a student the reasons why, um, why they failed or things like that. Um, <clears throat> but it does not imply causality. It can imply something called model causality, which is a term I made up, which is that um, if you input, if you tweak any input feature in a, in a model, it will affect the output in the, in the model, but it's not necessarily the way in real life. Okay. So now we come to the big idea, and I've got nine minutes left, counterfactual uh, explanations, causal model. This is the goal, I think. 
we want a causal model. This forms still part of the local model agnostic methods. Um, so what are counterfactual explanations? These are explanations that describe the smallest change to the feature values that changes the output to a, 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 an output that we desire. So for example, if a student has failed, then what we want to be able to do is we want to explain the model and we want to have features that explain why the student has failed. And then we want to uh, be able to tweak the input space as little as possible so that it's, it flips the output from fail to pass. Okay, similar to something called adversarial perturbations, which I don't have time to talk about now. So these are what if questions. And I, I think the, this is part of where we really need to go um, if we want intelligent systems. Okay, so again, some examples. What if you rejected a loan? Um, explainable machine learning and counterfactual explanations say why was he rejected, but not only why, but what can we do to change um, this person's situation so that he will be approved? A student is predicted to fail a course. Why is she predicted to fail? But what, what can we do to, ch what, is, what must she do to change so that she can, uh, what must she change so that she can pass? So how can we perturb the input space to change to a desired output? We've already seen counterfactual explanations in physics. For example, Hooke's law, F equals KX. What if we double the force? What would the displacement be? What if we halve the force? What, but these are, this is a counterfactual model. We have a model, but we can do, right? We can, we can, put, we can, we can change something and it, it gives us a counterfactual answer. So there's some methods. Um, these are, how do we do it? Well, it's simply these loss functions. I don't have time to go into all of that. Now, this is very, very important is all of these points I'm gonna mention must be true for there to be um, genuine counterfactual explanation. Right, the feature must be causal. You can't just have correlated features. You need, the features need to be, the features that you are trying to tweak, you're trying to adjust, must be causal features, obviously. Now, this is a big one. The features must be actionable. You can't have features, even features could be causal, by the way, but not actionable, meaning you can't change that feature. It's, it's a fixed feature, okay? Um, you can think of just many examples of that. And it must be within a possible world. We can't say, okay, we know that weight is uh, a cause of some disease. And so the model says you weigh, you weigh 80 kilograms, you need to lose 100 kilograms. Right, and then that's an impossible world, okay? So causal, actionable, and must be within a possible world. Even this um, Hooke's law, right? You can't, you can't keep applying larger and larger loads, right? The spring will eventually just break or whatever. So it must be within a possible world. Now, the big thing for me is it's all very promising to have this causal model, a model that not only predicts well, uh, but it's a model that can explain why those predictions are made. Not only that, it can also um, give you counterfactual explanations. Right? It's, it's, it promises a lot. But the problem is, how do, you, how do we validate this? And so this is actually a very new field, counterfactual explanations. I would say if, if we can tackle this problem, this is a, a big problem that um, we need to tackle is how to validate. So, you know, it's possible if you've got, if you do have actual data that is very similar to your counterfactual data, you could probably do that. But anyway, like anything, it's, it's all, it all looks great until you have to start validating. Okay, so what is the big idea? Um, this is what I was just saying. We want a model that, um, that is good at, at predicting. That is your, your traditional supervised machine learning. And, and obviously unsupervised, but it, it's um, we can we can start there, 
Then we want to use machine uh, interpretable machine learning, explainable AI to identify the main predictors. Then we want to take the next step to identify which of those are causal. And then we want to take the next step. Oh, by the way, um, in that section, which I didn't get time to talk about, is um, structural causal models and DADs. I did mention DADs in the beginning. And then the final step is we want to use these counterfactual explanations to determine how to change the outcome. Uh, and this is to develop a causal model. So a counterfactual model, a causal model. All right. Something that I am um, getting into a lot now is something called causal reinforcement learning. All the, all the, the techniques that I was explaining to you are just straightforward uh, supervised learning, where you've got an input and output data set. Reinforcement learning is you're working with, uh, with an agent who, um, who takes actions inside an environment and it changes the state of that agent. And so this is a, a kind of a new field that's coming out, uh, causal reinforcement learning. And if you want to read up more, check out this guy, Elias Varenboim, kind of the leader in the field. Um, there's software that's come up by Microsoft that created a software called Do Y. It's a library you can uh, probably uh, implement in R or Python, which kind of answers a lot of the things that I was mentioning. Then there's also this the Dag Dagity, which is um, helps to draw these causal diagrams. Then there's also um, other software called Alibi, Mace, and uh, Dice, diverse counterfactual explanations. These are the perhaps the best books right now in the field. Um, Counterfactual and Causal Inference by Morgan and Winship. Great book. If you want to read up more, Causality by Judeo Pearl, the father of causality, they call him. And also the book of why. And there's also another one that he wrote called Causal Inference in Statistics. Um, then there's just want to remind you of uh, the Interpretable Machine Learning book. And then, of course, without these two books, I don't think we can. These, these two books uh, by Hasty and Tipsharani, Introduction to Statistical Learning and Elements, they're amazing foundations for uh, learning machine learning, statistical learning as a foundation. And actually, many of the things uh, I spoke about come from those books as well. All right. Thanks so much, Bevan. It was uh, quite a good introduction to the field, and uh, you really nicely summarized the very difficult topics that was emerging recently in 145 minutes. And uh, I really enjoy your presentation. Thanks so much. And uh, uh, colleagues, I just want to open the floor for the questions uh, to Bevan. Any question from the audience? From the audience uh, connecting by the Zoom? Not yet on this side. Okay. And uh, perhaps, Bevan, I, I, I can maybe ask a couple of questions. And uh, related with the uh, counterfactual, actually, itself is a, is a very interesting topic. And the counterfactual explanation, generating the counterfactual explanation itself is an ill posed problem. And uh, considering the all possible space of the set of the counterfactuals, even if you have the um, discrete future set, the set will be really uh, large. And then identifying the right set of the counterfactuals for a given decision is a difficult problem. Mm -hmm. And are there any uh, uh, constraints that you can actually impose on the counterfactual generation process? That will be just creating the, some meaningful counterfactuals other than the act being actionable. Right, so that third point I was mentioning was the, the matter of the possible worlds. Mm -hmm. And so the way, that we, uh, the way that we determine what the, the counterfactuals are is via an optimization algorithm that I was showing you. And um, I think that it's obviously possible to put those constraints inside that algorithm. Mm -hmm. so, that, so that the counterfactuals are only occurring within that possible world. And for that, you need domain knowledge. Mm -hmm. my, feel, my feeling is with all these matters, you need people that are working in that field that know what the domain looks like so that you don't just have a data scientist coming and, um, and training these models and coming up with amazing ideas, but you need somebody in the domain that can say, no, these are the possible ranges that we can... Mm -hmm. um, 
Sure. I mean, one of the issue with the optimization problem, uh, the the formulation, the optimization formulation is usually not convex, and uh, so then the uh, the issue is you would be ending up with one of the counterfactual, which may be one of the many possible found counterfactuals based on the optimization. And uh, finding the right set of the counterfactuals is the biggest question. And uh, especially when the, uh, the feature space, the cardinality of the feature space is really large, then what happens is you would be ending up with a counterfactual, which may not be meaningful for the naked eye, and, uh, and are there any research that you can recommend on this direction, such as maybe the sparseness, enforcing the sparseness on the counterfactual space? Um, no, I can't, uh, not any specific papers. Okay. Thanks so much. And it seems like we have a quite good response from the audience. And, uh, and, and the... There is uh, one comment, good introduction talk. I guess a real life data illustration would help, especially in high dimensional data scenario. And uh, perhaps uh, we can invite you again for the future world, uh, future uh, workshops perhaps, or another talk where you can actually apply the techniques that you mentioned on a certain uh, applications. And uh, such as where the high dimensional data scenario is the part of those applications. And if there are no further um, uh, questions from the audience, uh, Bevan, thanks so much for your excellent presentation. And, uh, and uh, we really appreciate it. And uh, thank you.